Thank you, Sahani sir. Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning. This is the 1376th day of continuous webinar conducted by International Forum for Promoting Homeopathy. We welcome all to this session, and today our guest is Dr. K.P. Nanda Kumar, MD. Let us begin the session with one minute silent prayer. Thank you all. The International Forum for Promoting Homeopathy is conducting regular sessions for the last uh, 1,375 days, and we have three sessions in a row. Seven to eight, we have our Hindi session. Eight to nine, our international session in English, and nine to 10, we have the local language session in Malayalam. Today, our guest is Dr. K.P. Nanda Kumar, who has completed his MD from Kerala, and he is the chief consultant of Amrita Homeopathy Hospital Palakkad, and is uh, that. Uh, but one thing I would want to mention about the hospital is that this is the uh, one. This is the biggest private homeopathy hospital in Kerala, and the person who is an expert in treating almost all chronic diseases with, and uh, he is a person who treated most advanced uh, pathologically advanced cases also particularly renal cases, cancer cases, liver cases, and cardiac cases. And one of the most wanted international faculty from Kerala, and he has uh, made uh, presentation. He has made a presentation in uh, Dubai, Bangkok, Canada, USA, UK, etc. He was the chief faculty at the conference in the in the row in a he was the chief faculty at three conference conferences in a row at Toronto in 2023 and he is a trainer for government homeopathic medical court medical officers and he has the clinical experience of more than 30 years and a winner of many national and international award uh, Dr particularly Dr. N.K. Jairam Award from ISK, uh, Vaidya Sreshta Puraskaram Rotary Excellent Award in 2022, uh, Tejas Puraskaram in 2022 also. He, uh, last uh, time, Dr. has presented the management of pathologically advanced cases with homeopathy part one. And today, Dr. Nanda Kumar will be talking about the, his experience in that field. He will be sharing his experience. In, he, he has a certain protocols he gained from his experience and all the protocols he, he was in, he's intentionally sharing to us because he wanted to promote homeopathy among doctors as well as the public also. So we welcome, uh, the guest of the day, Dr. Nanda Kumar. Yes, Doctor, you can begin the session. Thank you, Dr. Danish. I think I can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, everything fine. Okay. Thank you. Let me just check. Is it on the screens? Yes, yes, it's coming. Is it over in cyst? Is it done? Okay. Yes, ultra abdominal scan. Uh, over in complex cyst? Yes, yes, over in complex cyst. Yeah, right, right. Yes, yes. <clears throat> so, good evening, everybody. I am Dr. Nantakumar from Palgar. Uh, last, I think, uh, we met, uh, last month and we were discussing about the management of, uh, uh pathologically advanced, uh, diseases, uh, by homeopathy treatment. So, uh, even the, in the beginning of, uh, the previous section, you know, the previous section, the last section where we had an interaction. I emphasized on few things. That is, uh, I it's my deliberate attempt to use the word management in chronic disease or in a pathologically advanced disease. 
because uh, we are the people who use the word cure, left, right, and center, whenever we speak. To my experience uh, in the past 30, 32 years, a cure happens when you manage the disease successfully for a stipulated time, maybe a prolonged time. There is no shortcut to the so-called cure. And cure is always, to my, it's my opinion, it's a myth because we feel that this, it's a confidence of, it's our confidence and the confidence what we give to the patient that, okay, now you are cured. But there is no investigation or any methodology to check that the disease will reappear or not. It's a fail. So uh, what I intend to say is that when we go through the modern medical uh, reports of uh, reputed hospitals, they never use the word cure. They always use the word management. The patient is managed well and discharged in good condition at the time of discharge. It's like that. So <clears throat> that is the importance of using the word management. Because in a chronic disease, from time to time, the symptoms of the patient changes, the condition of the patient changes, it can become worse. Now it will become better. So we will be happy that now the patient is better. But any point of time, the patient can go into a worse situation also. So it is our responsibility to maintain all these stages of this journey. And when you sail through all these phases of a chronic disease at one point of time, it might be a few months, maybe a few years, the disease might get cured. So that is why I have used the word management. So here, the symptoms has to be managed. The general condition of the patient has been touched to be managed. Moreover, in many, nowadays the patients are very educated. Moreover, when they come, when they get diagnosed with a particular disease, they have something called the Google and they Google and they grasp the maximum knowledge about the disease, its management, pathology, investigation, everything. And sometimes they sit in front of you as if they are ignorant about the disease. So you, it's your responsibility to check it. And the investigations being done during the course of the treatment also is a very important thing because you have to gain the confidence of the patient, especially in pathologically advanced diseases, by showing the patient that there definitely there is an improvement in this condition of the patient. So all this put together will induce a uh, confidence in the patient. So here I am going to share my experience uh, uh, of treating advanced uh, pathological cases. And we start with, we have finished half of the sessions last month. And now it's <clears throat> the next half. Now, this is a case of ovarian complex cyst. Uh, and um, before that, I would like to tell you that I'm going to share you my protocols. It's not a single drug or single dose. It's a protocol. There may be two or three drugs which I usually give at these conditions. Along with that, I will share you other drugs also which can, which may or may get uh, indicated in such cases, which I have found uh, effective in such cases. So this is an ovarian complex cyst case. Case You can see Mrs. Safia, she had right ovarian complex cyst. Is the, the scan, scan taken before the treatment. And Mrs. Safia, you can see, the disease, uh, the ovarian cyst has disappeared. Now she has only PID, pelvic inflammatory disease. In between, I just, when I saw the blind pelvic inflammatory disease, how will you diagnose pelvic inflammatory disease in an ultrasound scan? It's, uh, the, if you find the fluid in an ultrasound scan, if you find that there is fluid in the pouch of Douglas, that indicates a pelvic inflammatory disease. So that's it. Ultrasound finding <clears throat> of pelvic inflammatory disease. So in an ultrasound scan, if you find the pouch of Douglas free, there is no fluid, then it is, there is no PID. If it is moderate fluid or free fluid in the POD, it is, it signifies the pelvic inflammatory disease. In this scan, you can see moderate free, free fluid seen. That is 67 cc of fluid in the pouch of Douglas POD. 
So that is the diagnostic criteria of pelvic inflammatory disease. So the previous scan showed a right ovarian uh, complex cyst and the, now you can see the right ovary appears normal in size and ecotextile. So uh, when you prescribe uh, for ovarian cyst, it's very important that to diagnose what's the nature of the cyst because nowadays the incidence of malignant ovarian tumors are uh, Excuse me, Vidya. Vidya. They are, tell them that I am in a webinar. Okay. We'll call after one hour. Okay. So the importance of uh, the incidence of uh, malignant uh, uh, ovarian um, pathology has increased nowadays. I am getting so many cases, so I could imagine how much the modern medicine is uh, getting those cases. So the investigation is important. First, you have to. Uh, do the ultrasound scan. If there is any suspicious nature being uh, informed by the radiologist in uh, ultrasound scan, definitely you have to go for a uh, uh, CT scan. Not a plain CT scan, of course, with a uh, contrasted CT scan. Then the other investigation which you have to definitely do if there is if it is a suspicious lesion is CA-125. The test is CA-125, which is a tumor marker of the ovaries so you have to manage the case of ovarian cyst in a very professional way very scientific way that how a gynecologist deals with such a condition in his or her <clears throat> clinic so you have to manage it in the same way not like taking the symptoms and prescribing some drug now you have to do the investigations you have to do the scan you have to do the blood necessary blood tests and Rule out that there is nothing dangerous and then you start the treatment. So, uh, now I'll go to the protocol. The other test you can do is that uh, CEA you can do. Then uh, CAA, CA125 will almost confirm that whether it's uh, malignant or not. Because in my general, general malignancy, the CEA will be on the higher side. Uh, but not like the normal value is 5. If you see 6 or 7, don't say that this malignant. Because there are so many other conditions where the CEA is increased. In smokers, it will be high. And in uh, gallbladder pathologies, it will be high. In liver pathologies, it will be high. So, need not be like every C increased CEA above the level of 5 need not be a malignancy or cancer. But if you find a CEA 40, 50, 100, definitely there should be a chance. And the other specific uh, tumor markers as like we do the alpha fetoprotein for the liver, then CA-120, CA-19.9, PSA, and like that. So the specific tumor markers also has to be uh, done to rule out the malignancies. Here, uh, when you come to the prescription, uh, my most favorite drug in all tumors of the uh, ovaries it's calcareic carb and I use calcareic carb uh, 30 once in 4 days. I give one single dose once in 4 days. And for right-sided, palladium is my favorite. Palladium 6C. And for left, lacrosis 6C. And sometimes even some big uh, cases with symptoms which are troubling the patient if I want to repeat very frequently. I use LM potency 0 bar 1, 0 bar 3 to 0 bar 6. And 2 just 6 is another wonderful drug which we can give. And if it's an endometriotic cyst, hydrosis 3x is going to be very effective. You can give TDS. And in the biochemic, calcarea floor has been found. If after repeating, you cannot repeat, uh, if, you are, if you are given uh, 200 or three, uh, 30 doses for one or one or two months, and you are finding that, that there is a reduction in the size of the cyst, then you can just carry on with the calcarea floor 6 6 for another one or two months and check if you don't want to repeat that. So, and of course, the constitution is very important. Uh, calcarea card, if to me, calcarea card, if the typical calcarea card constitution, but the same patient uh, we, we, we say lean, if the calcarea carbon phosphorus, both are like with the polymer specific. The 
<clears throat> just from the physical constitution, if you get a calcare carb patient and with which is but, but the same symptoms of calcare carb, but without a calcare carb constitution, then uh, phosphorus is the drug. You can give phosphorus. So these are the general drugs which uh, comes to my mind. But the symptoms are very important. The pain on the right ovary, aggravated, lying on the right side, you have to take the modality. Uh, Marsol is my choice if that's a cardinal symptom, lying on the right side aggravation. And other symptoms, uh, concomitant symptoms also are also very important. So symptomatic preciseness in a case taking is very important and drug has to be prescribed on that aspect, which I don't want to say because it differs from patient to patient. But generally speaking, if you want to prescribe just on the basis of the pathology, that's what I am sharing with you. Don't say that Dr. Andomar is giving this medicine to everybody. No, it's not like that. But these are the drugs which are prescribed on the basis of pathologically because which we have a system here in our hospital that we get so many cases. So we make protocols. Protocols in the sense we take cured 150 cases of cured over insist and we study the uh, usage of drugs. Which are the drugs used in right over insist? Which are the drugs used in left over insist? So what are the common drugs used? What are the indications? And from that we make a protocol because we don't get much of a time for the detailed case taking for 10 or 15 or 20 minutes. We get only hardly 5 to 6 minutes. So for the very, very, for the very purpose and also to make a more precise uh, prescription and which is more and more effective prescription in a very short time, these protocols are made. So that's what I am going to share with you. But the other symptoms, you have to take the case and you find the uncommon peculiar characteristic and modalities as to be considered definitely with high uh, <clears throat> importance in every prescription. This is another endometriotic cyst. Uh, generally, endometriotic cyst of the ovaries are very difficult to treat. The response is very bad uh, because there will be multiple endometrial distribution not only in the ovaries but sometimes in the abdominal wall i have cases where we have we had a case with the there was a deposit on the abdominal uh, that's the rectus abdominis muscle so the patient developed severe pain in and around the umbilicus at the time of menses and of course the ovarian pain will be there so Endometriotic cyst is generally difficult to cure. If you ask me, the ratio of success in treating other cysts when compared to the endometriotic cyst, endometriotic is, is tough to me. But this case is good. It's resina. You can see the endometriotic cyst. And resina, it's the Snobotian cyst is only there. There is no endometriotic cyst. So... <clears throat> Endometriosis, definitely the symptoms are very important because you have to consider the dysmenorrhea. You can you have to consider the menometrorrhagia of the patient. So these are common symptoms of the patient. But the modalities, bleeding aggravated at night, bleeding aggravated during daytime, bleeding stops um, when she moves out, bleeding stops when she is at rest, like that. So the modality of the bleeding has to be Definitely has to be considered when you prescribe it. But as I said earlier, uh, pathologically, if you prescribe a drug in uh, endometriotic cyst, hydrostis 3x has, is found to be very effective. And recently, I have found one drug which is very effective in cysts, uh, that is agel marmalosa. Agel marmalosa. Uh, it is not agel folia, agel marmalosa. Agel folia is a one. Uh, both are from a single uh, herb or a tree, but uh, agel marmalosa is more effective in tumors and cysts, and agel folia is more useful in skin conditions. Mother tincture, agel marmalosa, mother tincture. Uh, now, the breast duct dilatation benign, you can fibrocystic disease of the kidneys with the breast ductal dilatation. Because earlier we used to say it as fibroadenosis of the breast. Now it is fibros. It is the nomenclature they call it fibrocystic disease of the kidney. Oh, sorry, fibrocystic disease of the breast. So here also uh, investigation is very important. Nowadays the incidence of breast cancer is very high. So you have to do a mammogram in every case of any suspected growth in the breast. An ultrasound can be done first and again 
that there's a categorization called Birats 1, 2, 3, and 4. The Birats is the categorization of the changes in the breast. Birats 1 is a normal, uh, <clears throat> uh, it's a normal uh, breast. Birats 2 with initial fibrocystic changes. Birats 3 with uh, a small suspicious uh, suspicious malignancy and birats uh, or it can be said as fibrocystic changes with uh, lymphadenopathy so uh, axillary lymphadenopathy birats 4 suspicious to malignant and birats 5 it is malignant so this is how it is categorized in ultrasound and also in uh, mammogram so this Birat's categorization should be considered when you before you go into a prescription. If it's a Birat's three or four, uh, then definitely you can ask the patient to go for a biopsy. And that, that biopsy is called minimum. You can do two things. FNAC will not work. Don't do ask the patient to go for fine needle aspiration cytology because sometimes it might go wrong. Because you are inserting the needle into a this much this much size of tumor and if you not get the one or two single tumors in this particular needle you you might miss the diagnosis that this is a cancer so what you should do is that there are two options one is two types of biopsies one is total excision biopsy then otherwise uh, if the patient doesn't want to go for an excision biopsy then we can go for a, a biopsy called true cut biopsy true cut biopsy you can remember this word true cut True cut biopsy. That can also be the true cut biopsy is done in lymph glands. If you see multiple lymph glands or large lymph glands, you want to rule out there is any it's a malignant or not, or if it's a reactive lymphadenopathy or it's a tuberculosis, you can refer the patient to a surgeon to do a true cut biopsy of the particular growth. So here, true cut biopsy is the most recommended form of biopsy in breast tractor dilatation. Now we'll go to the case. Ultrasound breast, you can see. Uh, focal ductal dilatation, transverse diameter, and when six o'clock position, left breast extending as on the towards the areola. The patient's name is Mary, and now the Mary, as you can see, normal. There is no it's a fibrocystic disease of the um, breast. Recently, uh, a research was done um, for fibrocystic disease as well as for the malignant um, conditions of the breast. One of the doctor, when one of my patients visited some uh, another doctor, uh, he's not in Kerala, but uh, actually he's an allopathic doctor, but he prescribed iodum. He wrote a prescription for iodum 3H to a malignant a breast cancer patient, one of my patients. Then the patient later came to me. I was surprised to know, why did this doctor prescribe iodum? Now, to my surprise, when I search in the net, I found that the latest studies which are done uh, in breast cancer with iodine, you can refer, you can Google and say effect of iodine in breast tumors. You just type and you read it. In our literature, it may not be read, but this is a knowledge to you. You can Google and find the effect of iodine in breast tumors. It's the latest studies which is going on around the world especially in US. So, uh, incidentally that I got the knowledge and then I tried in my patient. It's It works miraculous. You can try IRM 3X. You read it. You read it, confirm yourself, then only you use it because it's a, a very clinical, very scientific clinical study has been done with IRM. I read it in breast tumors. The other one, which <clears throat> uh, another drug, which I find very effective, in fibrocystic disease, conium, conium maculatum. And my choice of potency is uh, 3C, 3C BD. I give it uh, BD. Then Tuja, of course, you all know that Tuja 6C is my favorite drug. And acetic acid also. Once in four or five days, I give one dose of 200 or 30. You can read acetic acid. In the acetic acid, there is a statement. It dissolves the fibrous tissue in the body. Excessive fibrous tissue in the body. If you have, anybody has boric with you, you can take acetic acid and read the first para of acetic acid. This can be used in fibroid uterus, fibrocystic diseases. Even I, recently, I'm, I don't 
I cannot claim that there is an effect because recently only I started using in uh, one second, excuse me. Recently, I started using in neurofibromatosis also, but uh, I'm waiting for the results. Uh, but in neurofibromatosis, uh, if you, just because I mentioned that, uh, calendula is a wonderful drug for neurofibromatosis. Calendula mother tinder. Just try that. Neurofibromatosis. Okay. Now we will go into another ovarian cyst we have covered. This is... Uh, Left ovarian cyst, I said left lacus, right palladium, right lycopodium. So these are if you, if you want to prescribe on the basis of sites, but modality matters, symptoms matters. So consider that when you prescribe a drug. Polycystic ovary definitely. Uh, I think last time I don't know whether I have. Uh, if somebody is not was not there last time. I just want to tell you about polycystic ovary. Homeopathy uh, is most successfully, to me, it's the most successfully treated condition. I have few, a few months back, I have done a session here for just PCOS. But uh, you all should uh, <clears throat> know the pathology of PCOS. What is happening? What is happening in PCOS? You should know that why it is happening. The increased level of androgens, the levels of insulin, increased insulin levels. So how it influences the FSH, how it influences the LH, and what are the investigations to be done. So you have to do the ovarian, uh, you have to do the hormone protocols, FSH, LS, TSH, uh, AMH, anti-mullerian hormone, and lact. These are the investigations which you have to do in PCOS ultrasound abdomen and put together <coughs> you can diagnose uh, well the what's the condition of the patient because if the FSH is so high then uh, FSH is so low and, and LH is very high it's a huge pathology I don't want to go into that we will waste time on that so the ratio the, the uh, everything you're gonna say uh, this has to be considered before going for a prescription. And regarding the high levels of high levels of insulin uh, in this patient, in PCOS patient, need not be like, no, not in all cases. Not in all cases. I, I emphasize on that because the pathology always says that it is because of increased level of insulin. But we can see so many patients who are very really, that's with obesity, uh, <clears throat> And those who have some, some, sometimes they have the thyroid issues also. So if you, if the triad of PCOS is obesity, hyperinsulinemia, and uh, hypothyroidism. Then amenorrhea, hirsutism, acaranthus negligence, and so on and so forth. So many other symptoms. But in some patients, they will be very lean. A very lean uh, girl is being brought to, brought to your clinic. And when you do all the investigations, everything is fine otherwise, but... <clears throat> that a girl is a girl, the girl has PCOS. So need not be like in all cases there should be thyroidinemia. So and I, I have specified last time that cinnamon has been scientifically proved in homeopathy that it's a very effective medicine uh, for PCOS because scientifically, like it will in it's a in, it has a con, 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 content, it's such a component which mimics the insulin inhibitor, so that will uh, inhibit the other activities in the body and thereby correct the system and thereby the PCOS is cured. Then other one, uh, one other research which has been done is uh, uh, Pulse Atlas 6C that is also been done in nearly 40 to 60 cases where we got a success rate of nearly 80%. So if you can manage uh, PCOS nowadays successfully, I think that itself is enough for you to fill your clinic because that many number of cases are there nowadays in the society. Now you can see again uh, the bilateral polycystic ovaries, the normal study. So polycystic, and we'll go to next some other cases because a lot of polycystic ovarian cases, ovarian hemorrhage exists. 
जैसे कि ऐसा हेपेटोमेगली विथ बल्की पैन गैस पैनग्रेटाइटिस रिगार्डिंग द लिवर वी हैव वंडरफुल वेरी इफेक्टिव प्रोटोकॉल्स फॉर लिवर डिसीजेस इफ यू टेक अबाउट द मैलिग्नेंसी एंड आई थिंक दैट द मोस्ट सक्सेसफुल नंबर ऑफ केसेस व्हिच आई हैव been successfully man managing for the past many years there are cure cases are there but more than that as i said earlier cure 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 in the sense what if the patient comes to you with a liver cancer the scan should show that absence of the malignancy absence of tumor absence of the cancer the lesion in the liver this can't be done in an overnight process or maybe months or years the first thing is that the patient comes to in such a stage that when the modern science science tells them that this is nothing much to do uh, and you do something else you can go for a palliative one now extending the life of the patient giving a quality life to the patient everything is important so when you concentrate on that we giving emphasis to that and when you prolong the treatment and at some point of time you can see that the alpha fetal protein or the tumor markers coming down and the size of the tumor reducing what i emphasize here is the importance of giving or the importance of giving emphasis to the condition of the patient no so you have to give improvement to the patient that is more important in pathological advanced diseases so in hepatomegaly this case you can see bulky pancreas with hepatomegaly here the size is not mentioned it is just written enlarged but i will tell you the normal size of the uh, liver is 14 to 15 and 14.5 is the average size of the kidney or the fifth liver so anything above 14.5 can be said as a liver enlargement now again the fatty changes can be categorized into grade 1 2 3 <laughs> so if the some if you get a scan report and you find the liver measurement of the liver is 17.5 you can that is like 3 cm it's larger than a normal size it's not good it's dangerous so you have to reduce the size of the uh liver then you have to reduce the pan, uh, fatty changes of the liver because for that we the probability of the patient going into a chronic liver disease nowadays we have investigations for that the fibro scan of the liver is being done so this from the scores we can very well predict that whether the patient has a uh, chance the probability of going into chronic liver disease so here in the scan you can see again after that uh, reduced parenchymal volume with heterogeneous ectotext of the pancreas going to pancreatitis name is central kumar so wonderful case you can see the improvement because in chronic pancreatitis there is no much of things to do uh, only thing is that they can give antibiotics for a few days or a few weeks and after that if the patient doesn't respond then it's going into a very dangerous stage here <clears throat> then what all investigations you have to do in chronic pancreatitis you have to check because in any case of acute abdomen uh you have to go for an ultrasound nowadays don't blindly prescribe investigate the case diagnose the case because if it is a pancreatitis and if you don't find it out in the right time the life of the patient will, itself will be in danger so you do ultrasound definitely you can diagnose whether it's a stone whether it's a gastritis or mesenteric lymphadenopathy especially in children nowadays we are seeing so many cases of mesenteric lymphadenopathy it may be a reactive lymphadenopathy as a small few more full of food immediately the the mother complains one or two mouthful of food immediately the child will say oh my stomach is uh, aching it's paining definitely you immediately refer the child for a ultrasound and in most probably it can be mesenteric lymphadenopathy it can be due to an infection or due to reactive lymphadenopathy because nowadays these children depend on so many they consume lot of food from outside because nowadays mm, the youngsters and children they like the hotel food the bakery uh, food more than a home cooked food so this lead to either infection 
or a reactive lymphadenopathy due to some adulterations or the chemicals or preservatives added to those uh, food materials. So that has to be diagnosed. Again, as I said, in case of pancreatitis, there will be severe acute abdomen. And how will you diagnose it? One is ultrasound, as I said. Here, it's a clear-cut case with chronic pancreatitis. It can be acute pancreatitis also. The other blood investigation which you have to do <laughs> is serum amylase lipase. And potassium also has to be checked, serum potassium. So chances of increasing potassium is very high in chronic pancreatitis, and which is dangerous also because that is cardiotoxic and <clears throat> excessive level of potassium in the blood will lead to congestive cardiac problem. So, do the ultrasound, check the blood for amylase lipase, then of course CBC, potassium, all investigations has to be done. This central Kumar had hepatomegaly and chronic pancreatitis in the previous scan and in this findings, you can see liver is normal in size. So, now the liver has become normal in size. But pancreas is still an issue. And this is the third scan you can see where, believe me, pan chronic pancreatitis cannot be cured. That is, the what, that is what usually is being said. But here you can see the pancreas appears normal in size, shape and counter. Now the pancreas is normal in scan, in ultrasound. So the three scans where the liver was enlarged with pan bulky pancreas. In the second scan, the liver became normal, but the, the pancreatic changes were there. In the third scan, and it's a CT scan, you can see, the CTA, CCT of abdomen, the more precise scan. Here the pancreas appears normal. So mild hepatomegaly and fatty infiltration is there, but that's always there. See, when he was under treatment, his, the patient is from Salem, so, and, you, uh, and you can see the initial reading of amylase. It was 1,407. <clears throat> now, after our treatment, the amylase is 37, and lipase is 28. And now coming to prescription, of course, the symptoms matters. I, uh, we have given so many drugs. There was change of prescription all very alternate days because this patient was admitted and treated here. So when the patient had vomiting, it was treated symptomatically when he had uh, abdominal pain, the modality was taken, MACFOS was given for pain, colosin was given for pain. But apart from that, pathologically, if you want to prescribe, iris versicolor mother tinger is a almost specific drug for pancreatitis. Iris versicolor mother tinger. Beldona 3X is a good uh, drug in an acute pancreatitis. It will reduce the infection. It will uh, improve the pain of the patient. MACFOS in hot water will reduce the pain. And another mother tincture, which is very effective or which is, which I oftenly use is Calmec. Andrographis paniculata. Uh, that also you can give, but dilute it. My dosage is like 25 to 30 drops in one glass of water and it is being stirred and given every one hour or two hours, three sports each. So like that, because that's a general condition of the patient is not good, his vitality is not good. Yeah, so very mild doses, very mild potencies, never go beyond 3x or 6 in such pathologically advanced diseases. But should be repeated very frequently. LM also works miracles in uh, these cases because you have to repeat many doses. You cannot just give one dose of 30 and wait for 12, 10 days or one week or 15 days in a methodically advanced disease because the patient is suffering. The patient is having a group of symptoms, multiple symptoms, and investigations has to be done by stage by stage. The patient is also obsessive about that and he or she knows about the disease and they are also looking into the investigations and improvement in the investigations. So these are the main factors which, which you should do. And 
curing or getting result is i with my experience i think it is secondary Con managing the patient in a very professional way is more important you see the multi specialty hospitals they manage it in a professional way they don't cure it but the this investigations are done the observations are recorded so we also should do that we also should give uh, the importance to the patient's condition and observe it and continuous monitoring of the symptoms, monitoring of the values that has to be done. Another case of uh, hepatorenal syndrome. So hepatorenal syndrome, that is uh, both the liver and kidneys are affected. Mr. Prasad, you can see the liver is enlarged, 16.2, fatty hepatomegaly, renal parenchymal changes, and with enlarged prostate. Mr. Prasad, you can see the prostate is normal now. The kidneys are normal now. Only the fatty liver is there. So, uh, see, when you talk about hepatorenal syndrome, it's like when the liver fails, at some point of time, the kidney also fails. Uh, that's why it's called hepatorenal. It's not renohepatic. I'm treating thousands of uh, kidney failure patients, but even if the creatinine is 12 or 13 or 15 or 20, nothing will happen to the liver. But when the liver, in liver cirrhosis cases, you can see in advanced cases, the creatinine will slowly, gradually shoot up. So that's why it's called hepatorenal syndrome. So the investigations has to be done. So in all chronic diseases, you have to check the creatine also, whether it has affected the kidneys, the kidneys function being affected because of this. So liver enlargement, my choice, phosphorus is a specific. Uh, you take this rubric enlargement of liver in all the repertories. Phosphorus is the single rec which is present in all the repertories, whether it is boric, which is skin, liver is complete or um, uh, any five to six pointing has and all these separate trees with the computer you can check if you have the software with you it's a single rubric what are the medicines used by different uh authors of repertories so phosphorus covers almost uh, in uh, is seen in almost all the repertories so phosphorus for liver enlargement another specific for liver is magnesium muriaticum i think i have sent it last time because Actually, that drug, I have never thought about this drug. But when I read the book of uh, George Vitalkas, The Essence of Mentidimedica, you read that, you, if you have the book, you read Magnesium Uriaticum. He has written almost, uh, that is a specific for a liver disease. For that, he has narrated so many stories. Uh, that apart, uh, there is a pathology. That is why he has written that. So we started giving uh, Magnesium Uriaticum in cases and wonderful results. We gained wonderful results by using that. But there are my, many of my friends in India and abroad. They use 30, 200. But I use, I start from LM potencies. Then only gradually enhanced potencies. And when when, it, when talking about liver, the drug which comes to our mind is Cheldonium Cardus. Definitely, no doubt about that. Cheldonium is good. Cardus is good. Cardus, my choice is Europe, uh, LM potencies. Um, Cheldonium, of course, I use 3x potencies, potencies. but uh, there is one drug which we in Kerala especially, even the doctors of Kerala, they also doesn't use it much. That drug is called Phylantus Neruri. In Malayalam, it is called Kedar Nelly, which is a common herb which is used in our villages, and it's a home remedy in jaundice. And we have a medicine called Phalantus Nervori, but very rarely used by homeopaths. Believe me, a wonderful drug in liver disease, and we all know about it. Next time, you try Phalantus Nervori. And one more cardinal usage of Phalantus Nervori is menorrhagia. Use in menorrhagia. Of course, Talapsi, Bursa, Pastoris, Trillium, all these drugs are there. But, try Philanthus. It will give you wonderful results. Next is my 
gallbladder calculus. Uh, <clears throat> so once a patient is diagnosed with gallbladder calculus, the only one option, there's only one option, cholecystectomy, removal of the gallbladder. So the success rate of treating gallbladder gallstones depends on few factors. Uh, if you have a single stone, 3 mm, 5 mm, 6 mm or 10 mm, I'm more successful in single stones. Or countable stones. There are four stones or three stones. The scan says there are three stones or four stones. Okay, good. You can treat it. But some in some cases, it, the gallbladder will be totally filled with stones. Multiple calculus. Even the our sonologist can't count because it's a cluster of stones. I have found it very difficult to get good results. But even in such cases, we have got, I will show you some cases, but generally speaking, it's very difficult. Why? Because the follow-up is difficult. Because you have three stones, the largest measuring 10 mm. Now you give medicines for three months. Then after that, you take a scan. The 10 mm is 7 mm. Now you know that the medicine is responding. Now it's only a matter of time. But in multiple stones, you can't count the stones, you can measure the stone. So then how will you follow? It's difficult. So that's the difficulty in treating multiple gallstones. Countable gallstone or single gallstone are more responsive and we can get a follow-up about the disease. Third, if the stones are very small, 2 mm, 1 mm, multiple stones with 2 mm or 3 mm, now the problem is this these stones is that and if it is something is uh, obstructing the neck of the common bile duct now you are under risk the patient is under risk not you because <clears throat> if it drops into the common bile duct it will obstruct in a place called ampule of twitter which is the junction of the common bile duct and the common pancreatic duct now le leading to obstructive jaundice and pancreatitis of course, nowadays it's very easy to manage that. They do the ERCP, endoscopic, retrograde, cholangiopancreatography, and remove the stone. But if such a case you get and the scan says, this is the, this, the scan shows that there is a small stone in the neck of the gallbladder, then you should be very careful and you should follow up very frequently to avoid such a casualty during the course of the treatment. So this is uh, multiple small calculus are seen in for the leap. And now, absolutely there is no stones in the gallbladder. You can see no echogenic focus seen. <clears throat> and there are few microliths, that is few kidney stones. Uh, gallstone, again, Magnesium muir is one drug and sulfur serobartrip. Why? Those who have read uh, sulfur in many literatures is that it improves the biliary circulation. So, we know that the intrahepatic biliary radicular circulation has to be re-established for promoting the uh, treatment for promoting that uh, dissolving the uh, gallstones because many of many in many cases the gallstone is formed due to stagnation of the body so that has to be prevented so what which drug to me sulfur is the number one drug another drug is myrica m y r i c a myrica mother tincture not myristica sebifera that is different it is myrica then, as I said, magnesium muriaticum, cholesterinum 6C, and uh, definitely cardis is a wonderful drug. These are the pathologically drugs which you can prescribe pathologically. And of course, symptom matters. You have to take the constitution, you have to take the totality, and the correct drugs also has to be given. But believe me, always use lower potencies. Uh, don't go for higher potencies because <clears throat> in these cases, symptoms changes. Because in all pathologically advanced cases, the symptoms 
go on changing its nature. So you might need to change the drug, change the strength, change the repeat. So always give a room for this when you prescribe in pathologically advanced diseases. In this case of prostatomegaly, you can see 82 cc is the size of the prostate. Uh, Mr. Velavitan, prostate, prostate of 82 cc. Now, here the prostate is 52. This is something, <clears throat> if you ask in a, uh, it's something impossible as per the modern medicine because reducing from 82 cc to 52 cc. But we can do it. Homeopathy can do it. He also has multiple calculus. You can see the calculus. But this here, uh, I put this just to show you the reduction in the size of the prostate. Everybody knows Sabal Cerulata. It's our specific. Every homeopathic physician prescribes Sabal Cerulata. And one next Sabal Cerulata, one next is almost the specific. The other one is Barita Carp Cerobartri if you want to prescribe pathologically. Conium Cerobartri or Conium up to Conium 3C. But one drug, one mother tincture, Hydrangea is equally if you ask me Hydrangea or Solidago, I will say both. Both are equally good. Many people must not have thought about Hydrangea because the many for many of us Hydrangea is more specific or more useful in kidney stones but of not all but it's a wonderful drug for mean and hypertrophy of the prostate again as i said earlier you have to do the investigations psa prostate specific antigen and the pvr is also very important in this scan you can see the past wide is 440 see he had a full bladder of 436 cc and after widening only 20 cc has been void. 414 is being held back. It's called post void residue. So, in all cases, the suspected cases of <clears throat> been in hypertrophy of the prostate, along with the scan, ultrasound abdomen, whole abdomen, KUB, and prostate, write PBR, post void residue. This is the patient says that he is uh, urinating five to six times night. Many times it's because of uh, this increased PPR, post void residue. Because if he is having a collection of 300 ml and the patient voids, the only 100 ml passes. Again, 300 ml is uh, stored back. Now, again, after 100 ml, again, he feels like passing urine. So that's why he is getting frequent urination. So reduce the PPR with our medication. If you ask me, two drugs, stramonium and opium are wonderful drugs for reducing the post void residue along with Naxomica is also a wonderful drug. And this is uh, calculus. Just, we have already discussed about all these diseases. As the time is just uh, moving, we will go for some different uh, conditions. Renal cortical cyst uh, is not a pathologically advanced disease. You can see the scan here, but if somebody says in the ultrasound that he has a cortical cyst in the kidneys, you ignore it. <clears throat> but repeat the scan every six months because we have to roll up whether it's the beginning of the polycystic kidney pattern because the kidney has got cortex and the medulla. If the patient develops a small cyst in the uh, cortex, that's called cortical cyst, and it doesn't have any much of a pathological significance. But if there are multiple uh, cysts and you have to do scans uh, repeatedly because the number should not increase and uh, it should be the differential diagnosis is polycystic kidney. So for ruling out uh, polycystic kidney, you have to do frequent ultrasound scans. And this is a case of prostate. You can see 43 cc, Mr. Ali. So <clears throat> Uh, that's all. So this is a different case. Uh, very rare. Rare in the sense, we very rarely get such cases. Conductive hearing loss. Uh, let me give the heading hearing loss. There are three types of hearing loss. One is 
sensory neural hearing loss. Then conductive. Third is mixed hearing loss. The three types, conductive, sensory neural, and conductive. This is conductive hearing loss. And once, if you have a hearing loss of 30 decibel or 40 decibel, usually it's said that it's fixed. You cannot uh, improve the decibel uh, of this patient. That is, the, the audiogram is measured in decibels. So if somebody has, uh, normally is 15 to 20, 10 to 15, 20 is the normal, depending on the age. A child should have 10, 12, 13. So when the decibel increases, it shows that your hearing is being affected. Now we will see this case. You can see Mr. Madhu, he is having a right 28 and a left 33 decibels. This is before treatment. And now 16 and 21. It's normal. The hearing sensitivity within normal limits. And the left has 21, maybe minimal. Okay. Again, I repeat, you can go through the uh, audiogram once again. His right had 28 decibel and left 33. Now right from 20, uh, 28 to 16 and left to 21. It's a good case. It's very difficult to improve the hearing. And pathologically, if you ask me, my, my specific mother tinger is chinopodium, chinopodium mother tinger, acid salicylicum, acid salicylicum, causticum, and calimure. And you have to give calimure 6x. And you have to give medorinum as an intercurrent remedy. Another almost specific in mixed hearing loss. It can be used both in conductive, sensory neural, and in mixing. Mixed hearing loss is mephitis, mephitis. So, Dr. Danish, 9 yes. o'clock. <laughs> yes, yes, it is exactly because uh, uh, since the presentation was so uh, important and so all the cases were brilliant and that's why I didn't in interfere in this case <laughs> because uh, you have shown the beauty of homeopathy in uh, all aspects because uh, the presentation uh, you have shown that a homeopath is not a simple uh, doctor, but he is a multi specialist. And, and by all means, you prove that this is uh, exactly what every homeopath uh, shall be or m must be. No, in this, I would always I emphasize to even my students when I take classes in medical college, you should possess knowledge about the disease. You should handle the disease in a very professional way. The homeopathic methodology or your myasins or totality or whatever it is, it is just for the purpose of prescription. Speak in the language of where the common man knows. Speak, speak in the way that how they understand. If they doesn't understand our myasin. And somebody was saying you should teach myasin and all. Nonsense, yeah. Cannot be done. Oh, oh. Exactly, exactly. Now I invite uh, Dr. Maria Shalsheda to say what a thanks to the session. Dr. Maria. Thank you, Dr. Dinesh. Good evening to all. Good morning here in America. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nanda Kumar. It was a great session. Thanks for sharing with us your knowledge or your experience and also all the remedies that you use and the potency the way you use. It was very, very powerful uh, presentation. So thank you very much. I thank you. always thank you. am missing with all the sessions on IFPH and thanks to all the team IFPH team because they are working so hard to bring Thank us so excellent conferences. Yeah, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Uh, uh, there is a, a uh, there is a question. Yeah. Uh, Mephitis for somebody is asking for me me Mephitis thirty. You can give a one dose one day for. You give it for two weeks, then stop it. Wait for the improvement. Uh, you give medorinum weekly one dose. Then you can give uh, chinopodium mother tinger, acid salicylicum, lower potency 6. So, Calibur 6x is a specific, whether it is conductive hearing loss or um, sensory neural or mixed Calimur background remedy, you just give. Thank you. Uh, with that, we come to the end of the day. 1,000. Hubert! <laughs> yes. Hmm. 
<laughs> today i am not talking because okay, no, <laughs> excellent to you <laughs> yeah take it uh, okay. all, uh, uh, since there was no time for discussion oh yeah no that's because thank you so much the... and thank you for this opportunity loved it thank you yeah. Thank you, Dr. Danda Mukhavar, and those who participated in the session. Tomorrow we will have a session from Dr. Uh, R. Prakash, uh, who will be talking about uh, the a talk on chronic diseases. With that, we come to the end of the day. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's over to Dr.